Again, welcome to our, this is our fourth webinar panel in our series called Expanding the Dialogue on Autism, Reflections on Research and Real Life, and today's uh, panel is on healthcare. Uh, my name is Rebecca Lazo. I work for the Institute on Community Inclusion. Uh, we're hosting these discussions as part of, of our 50th anniversary celebration because we are committed to expanding the discussion around autism and developmental and intellectual disabilities. Let's get on to um, talking with our with our panelists and introduce um, Tom Sanicandro, who will be the moderator of this discussion today. Tom is the uh, director of the Institute for Community Inclusion, and I will let him say a few words now. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for getting this together, and thank you everybody who's joining us today, and particularly our panelists who are all here. Uh, this is the first time that we've been running this seminar that we're actually most of us are in the same room and all the panelists are in the same room. So that's a first for us. So it's very exciting. I'm glad you're all here today. Um, why we're doing this, like Rebecca said, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary and we wanted to do it in a way to add value to the community. Um, and we thought a good way to celebrate would be to run uh, informational speaker series. And we chose autism um, when we were thinking about autism, though, we wanted to make sure that we included people with autism in our series. So every single event has had experts with autism on the panel. So as a result of that, we're getting a very different view than sort of the typical uh, conversations around autism. We think it's really a much richer, more meaningful conversation. So. It's been very exciting for all of us that have been involved and we're hoping it's going to be just as interesting and informative for you. Today's series, we're going to talk about healthcare and autism and what that means. So thank you again for everybody for being here. I'm going to shift back to you, Rebecca. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, and it's only going to be me for a second because um, today I, I'll introduce Dr. Uh, Karen Munir, um, who's been my main contact and worked very closely with me to help me identify um, this extraordinary panel that's gathered today. Dr. Munir is Director of Psychiatry at the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and Leadership Education Program for the ICI and the Division of Developmental Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. And also, he's Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Munir um, has relationships with all the people that are here today. And um, I'm going to, um, Dr. Munir, if you'd like to say something about yourself and your work, you may. But I'm going to then, we'll let um, Hannah and uh, Matt and Billy uh, or, and his family introduce themselves. Well, I just want to thank you, Rebecca, for organizing this, and Tom, and congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the ICI, one of my most favorite institutes uh, in the world, yeah. and you do terrific work. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting us, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Great. Thank you. Hannah, would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Hannah Sullivan. I am a patient at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Karen Munir is my neurologist and he works with me. He's an excellent doctor. And I'm very honored to be here uh, at this ICI meeting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Orell. I am also one of uh, Dr. Munir's patients. And um, yeah, I pretty much echo everything that Hannah said. I've had nothing but great experiences with Dr. Manier, and it is a uh, pleasure to be here. Would either of you like to say how old you are or what you're doing now? Just so people in our audience have uh, sort of a context for what you're doing besides sitting at our table. <laughs> huh. Do I go first? Sure. Uh, I am 24 years old. I am currently working at the Home Depot in Bellingham as a garden associate with plans to become, once I leave there, I wish to study my, what I studied for in college, which was a, the, a bachelor's in arts for video game design and programming. Wow. Excellent. Great. Uh, and I am currently a cashier at a, this is, this is where the camera is, right? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So I am currently a cashier at CVS in South Easton. And eventually once I leave there, I hope to pursue a career as a, an actor, mostly based here in Boston. Great. Okay, 
Okay, Bill or Kathy or Billy, would you like to say hello? Hi. Really? Hi. Hi. My name is about yourself? Oh. I'm 21 years old. Great. I go to Mount Lake New England School. I've been seeing Dr. Lynn since 2002. Okay. I work at Foodie and ABS. Okay. Thank you. And who's with you, Billy? Dr. Mooney, your mom and dad, and these people are with me. And your mom and dad. Maybe they would like to say hello, too. Sure. My name is Kathy Paquette. I'm honored to be Billy's mom. We've been a patient with Dr. Mooney for many, many years, and we feel lucky and blessed to be with him. Great. And I'm Bill, um, Billy's dad. And I echo what Kathy said. Well, welcome everyone. We're really, really glad to have you here today. And um, Tom, would you like to get started with our questions? Sure, thank you everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I may occasionally um, address a question to someone specifically, um, but you can feel free to speak whenever you want. And we're just gonna have a conversation today. I know for some people it's not so comfortable to be sitting in a room like this talking to um, the, the microphone we have in the center, but just, you know, I want you to just express yourself and let's talk about um, healthcare. Why don't I start with a question? It's what are some common issues that people on the autism spectrum encounter when they're seeking healthcare? Um, why don't I start with, with um, Kathy? Okay. So a lot of times people on the autism spectrum may have um, the public um, state insurance called Mass Health, and sometimes that doesn't cover every doctor we want for, for our, like for my son or for ourselves. So sometimes that can be a barrier. Additionally, there's huge waiting lists for doctors um, who we find are, um, work well with adults and young people on the spectrum. So sometimes it, 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 accessing someone at the time you need it may be difficult. Um, and then other times, um, if, they don't, if they're not very autism savvy, we need to explain to them you know, how to deal with you know, our loved one or ourself um, with, you know, in, in the best way so that they get the optimum experience that's successful and that um, Every, they can work together to be a team to um, figure out the health care because a lot of times there's barriers with, ch with children and adults on the spectrum with um, doctors not understanding you know how they think how they mm -hmm. feel I mean specialists obviously do because that's their specialty but when you go to common practitioners like looking for a primary care provider or going to a dermatologist or a podiatrist, they may not understand um, how to interact appropriately and make things easier. Right. Matt, do you wanna? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> how do I put this? Um, I mean, my, I mean, my, my parents who you know, are here are here today. Um, sort of, kind of. I don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, I don't want to say kept me out of the loop when it come when it came to find like a primary yes. primary care doctor because you, you know, obviously you know I was diagnosed when I was just in preschool, so you know they, I didn't know they what they were going through. I, but um, I think. If I'm going to speak in general, a lot of the challenges we kind of deal with is people who just sort of deal, who just kind of go off of a sort of a textbook example and an outdated one at that, I might add, of what people on the autistic spectrum can't do. So it was like, oh, autistic spectrum, that means, oh, he doesn't have a filter. Oh, he crumbles easily in social situations and it's, it's, not, it's not helpful. At all. 
Dr. Yamar? Well, um, I think that uh, all three patients of mine who are just so wonderful enough to be here uh, have been with me for a very long time. And uh, I think they will probably continue to be with me. Mm -hmm. And I will try yeah, to stuck with us. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> as, for sure. as best as I can <laughs> to guide them in the health system. And I think what uh, Kathy was talking about, you know, the what the insurance restrictions are, because obviously that's doesn't you know, mass health is accepted at children's hospitals, not an mm -hmm. issue. But um, in general, um, it's very difficult, for example, to find corresponding adult providers that I can say, I will talk to Matt and, or Hannah and say, well, you know, there's a great doctor at uh, such and such hospital. It's very convenient for you. Why don't you try it out and see, and I will be here to help. But I can't say that because in the system, um, this type of transition from child to uh, adult services after a certain age is very difficult. Mm. I don't think that's necessarily um, true for uh, many of the other specialties, in, in particular in psychiatry or developmental uh, areas uh, in which we specialize. Uh, and that's a very unique issue. Uh, but in uh, adult services, which medical or surgical, that's not necessarily the case. If you have a surgical emergency, you will be treated by an adult provider mm -hmm. at the time. But it's very difficult to find a corresponding sort of a provider in, in the psychiatry field. So that's, that's an issue, and it's always mm -hmm. been an issue. And um, for example, in other countries that I go to um, in Europe, Italy, Spain, England, uh, there are a lot of uh, specialists that specialize in adult services because they work in the catchment system and they have, you, can, you know where to refer a person. Whereas here, it's, it's really, um, the patient is, and the family of the patient has to be able to search out the, the right provider and find the provider. It's not a catchment based system. It's not, even though you might have a public insurance like MassHealth, you don't have a public provider system. Uh, it's a very complex situation. Um, so, so the, um, this is very important, particularly because even uh, in, like in my, my colleagues in developmental pediatrics, for example, in, in child services are very much like do what I do. So they're very important in mediating this situation. Um, and at Children's, we created a, you know, the autism center to try to create an autism friendly hospital. But, uh, and so these developmental specialists are kind of mediators and social workers are mediators. And we, we developed this kind of a uh, patient and family friendly system to do that. But uh, that mediation needs to continue through the adult services in the healthcare system because what drives the how you get services and how you get treated in the adult services as well, like how long do you wait for an MRI scan? Or are they understanding your needs at the time you're going to have an EEG test? Or if you have a sprained ankle, you're going to have an x-ray. And how you get treated, what kind of room it is, what are the sensory issues mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. triggers. Um, mm -hmm. That mediation, I don't think exists in adult services as yet. And partly because, you know, we, we, have, we are experiencing this, um, um, the incidence of autism that's gone up over the years. And so I think there is going to be more and more recognition of this issue of the need for mediating adult services. So the way I see it, I think that the developmental and behavioral aspects mediate physical health service care provide provision and how the environment is regulated in that and makes it much more friendly for the, the patients and the family's experience. And I think um, the other issue with that, which is complicating, is, for example, someone like Matt or Hannah 
they take responsibility. They both drive, they mm -hmm. both have a job, and they are both very talented, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and, but as young people, they also work in jobs that is not necessarily what exactly what they want to do at the moment, but mm -hmm. in the future, they have a lot of hopes and aspirations. They will have to take, they're very supportive families, but they will have to take a lot of responsibility in mediating and finding the providers and making these connections. And as Matt said, he was out of the loop because you know his parents yeah. and Hannah's parents have been incredible. And so they will always help. And I'm sure Billy's parents, incredible. So they, they will always help. So that support system, the family support system is very important. And what we have in the room is not very representative of everybody mm. because we have mm. individuals here who are very exceptional. And so I think that, um, and I think, you know, people have done studies actually looking at these kinds of supports and family supports and other types of services. And it's really, there are certain predictors of that, that, you know, that necessarily has to do with things like income and, or the intactness of the family and things like that. So those resources where you live, are very important. It's actually, it does not depend on whether the child speaks or the person has significant language development or incredible cognitive skills and things like that. But it's actually dependent on many of these other factors that are very protective of the child and the person in society. And so, because we have a social system that I think is not built around helping, like we, we provide uh, public health sort of a care insurance, but we and 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 in this, but this applies to specific centers which may not exist in some places. But um, but Massachusetts, we're very lucky. Yes. But on the other hand, uh, we don't have a an organized social system that will and behavioral system that will guide that system into into its place to give you the support. And then in very concrete situations, it's much more responsive. Like if you have an accident and you go to the emergency, it's much more responsive because it's very straightforward. The system mm -hmm. responds in a, in a very reflex situation, but in much more other types of situations, like finding the right psychiatrist, right primary care, it's much more difficult to make that transition without the support system. And therefore that absence of degrees of that makes a big impact on the people. So I, I took a long time to explain it. Uh, so what I'm trying to sort of summarize by saying that there is a relationship between the social network and the behavioral issues and how individuals with autism face the uh, negotiation with the healthcare system and in particular areas this becomes very, very complicated and difficult and challenging. Um, so you can't separate the two because autism is a, basically a behavioral diagnosis. And, you know, it's a social condition in, in many ways. It's, a, it's, a, it's also a genetic and medical condition, but it also affects the way people are functioning. And so that's, that's why it's so important for healthcare providers to learn but beyond that, just learning within a given system is not enough. We need to build, we need to build services mm -hmm. uh, that are currently not available in the adult sector mm -hmm. to the same extent that they're available in the child sector. And I think 20 years ago, that was the case for the child sector yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we made a we made a lot of progress, and and we we can very much, I think we can very much uh, be very sort of uh, proud of what we have achieved so far, but I think there's a long way to go with the adult services. And I'm very glad that we're having, you know, in this room, some young, young adults to, uh, to bring up some of these issues. Great. Thank you. Um, Hannah, the uh, question was, what are some common issues for people on the autism spectrum that they encounter when seeking health care? Do you, do you want to weigh in on that? Well, I don't really remember that much when, about the healthcare provider issues that we had because when I was diagnosed, I was very young and I had 
like Matthew said, absolutely no idea what was going on. And I remember that my mother had told me that when she was talking to my general, uh, when I was a young uh, girl and I had to go see doctors, he, uh, she was telling my general care provider about how I was different than other people. And at first they didn't really believe that I had autism because at that time, autism was very new. I was about in one in 10,000 people who had autism. So it was a very new thing and a lot of people thought it was just a myth. They were thinking, what exactly is this disorder? Does this even exist? So a lot of people- Or like it's just kids acting up. Exactly. Yeah. Some people just think it's they're having mood swings, but it's an actual uh, condition. And there's a lot of issues in communication with that sort of thing, because obviously at that age, the, the kids won't be able to tell for themselves what exactly is going on with their bodies at the time. Mm. And depending on the severity of the autism, it might be a little bit easier, it might be harder. And especially if it's a lot more severe, it might not be uh, as easy for them to get health care providers because some people might think that they might have something else like mood swings or bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. And there can be a lot of misunderstanding between the two. So it's important for both doctors and patients to have understanding of the condition and to work forward mm -hmm. for a common goal, goal to understand and help treat people with autism. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. yeah, early on, um, when Billy was small, we would go to the pediatrician, and a lot of times the pediatrician would not address the real issues that we go in with because he basically attributed to um, the behavior as poor parenting and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we leave the doctor's office very frustrated, not really getting the treatment that we go in for um, to a point where we change doctors. And then that started the whole, whole thing going. Um, it took many years to, to come to grips with the issues and to actually find the right treatment. It is a lot of, a lot of background work, a lot of work on the parents. And what I'm concerned is, is as Billy gets older and we're getting older to keep that kind of support in place is, you know, it's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. It's, it's all the background work, as Bill said, in, in finding the right providers, making the right connections, explaining how things are, and getting treatment in place. Um, and now, um, like Dr. Lunia said, the pediatricians kind of got it. They have it. They know what they're doing now. And, you know, it's so it's so common. But these three are going to be trailblazers in the adult world because it's not as understood in the adult world. So no pressure. <laughs> oh, no pressure at all. No. That, that sort of segues into the sort of the next question that we can talk about would be what would be helpful to healthcare providers um, in communicating better with, with individuals on the spectrum? What do you think would help this product process or help healthcare providers? What kind of training or what kind of, what do you think is important for healthcare providers in treating someone on the spectrum? Anybody wants to take a step? Um, I will, but I'll wait yeah. for the children. I mean, the yeah. young adults first. <laughs> Anna? Yeah. Well, obviously, it's best for the um, the doctors to have a more general under understanding mm -hmm. about what autism is, because, yeah. like we said before, at first, when the condition was very rare, not a lot of people understood what was going on, and thankfully, over the years, we've gotten. Uh, people were, be able, were able to diagnose what was happening more often. They realized uh, that this was an actual condition, but we still need, uh, they still need to know about the, the, some of the common triggers that we have as autism. Like some people might not be willing to be touched. Some people might have eye, eye contact issues. Uh, to, probably to understand the whole gyna, uh the whole spectrum of autism disorders because there's a lot that goes on. Uh, mm. For example, I have high functioning autism, which means I I was able to go to college and go to high school Same. and go through all of that. 
without an issue. Heck, I know how to drive a car now. And I really thought at the beginning, I don't know how to do this. And I was able to get here without any issues at all. And it's kind of crazy. But on the other yeah. side, there are people who are a lot more severe and they cannot advocate for themselves what exactly is going on with going on. So uh, if the healthcare providers had more training on not only the severe, the extremely severe types of autism when they're very rigid and they have, they're set in their own ways, but also the ones like myself and Matt mm -hmm. who are more high functioning and able to advocate for themselves. That would lead to better communication and a yeah. general understanding on how to treat better autism in both for children and for us adults. Yes. Great. It's amazing, Anna. Thank you. Amazing. Very clear. So, I mean, there is a paradox here that I was mentioning that, um, that I think that even in Hannah's case and Matt's case, the fact that you have more higher functioning um, level of autism, uh, you have uh, more unique problems that might be missed and you might still face significant issues whether it's in healthcare or in employment. And I remember a story that Matt told me once where you were told not to say that you have autism. Right oh, now. yes. Right. And they, uh, yeah, I was with a group, you know, I'm just going to name names, Mass Rehab. And they, and, and they, um, we were talking about the possibility of disclosing the disability because I had just been let go from a job for showing some kind of behavior. Some of it, I swear to God, was made up. Others, yeah, it's, no, others it was like, oh, fair enough. But the point is, we, they were, we were talking, talking about, should we just disclose it? Should we just tell them so they have a better idea of what's going on? Like, well, but then they'll know and they won't and this, that, and the other. And, it, and so um, we pretty much dropped them like a bad habit. And but that's clearly a training issue yeah. because it's a training uh, it's issue. Not just, uh, it's what I was saying earlier. It's a, yeah. it's that textbook example. I'm, example. If I seem angry, it's because well, I am. But um, it's a textbook example of okay. This is okay. He has autism. That automatically means he or she can't do this. Can't do that. Can't do this. Can't do that. I'm like close the book. I'll burn the book. Right. <sighs> I'm fine now. Okay. So that's I mean that's basically uh, a training issue. Uh, and it's not a, a, a specific to a singular organization. It's just like we just need to be have responsibility. Each hospital, each agency, make sure that every employee who's advising people should have some level of training. Now, okay. what is that level of training? I mean, we know that even in the police force, for example, there's a level of training. Uh, how do you um, interact with someone who might have autism uh, when you give them a ticket or when you do a call, when you respond to a call in a home or something. So I think people are learning uh, on the job and uh, mm -hmm. it's very important that we systematically uh, prepare. But I think that when you do have a more sort of a traditional way of autism that you come across and people understand that this person might have autism, it sometimes be more straightforward. Uh, for a person to understand that and to whereas if you don't have you know you have much more subtle characteristics mm. then i think it might so so what i'm saying is that the challenges are across the board and we need to prepare for every level of the person's uh, characteristic and treat people as individuals because there is actually a saying in our field that's saying when you see one person with autism, you have seen one person with autism. Because you can't yeah. really generalize. Each person is different. Each person is unique. Mm. So the fact that we say, you know, higher functioning doesn't necessarily mean that every higher functioning person is the same. They all have different unique uh, characteristics. And, um, but we need to really prepare people to understand uh, what are those issues. Uh, and I think uh, that would really be very helpful and in, in training and I think um, as Kathy said we for the adult services I think we need to also guide people as to how you seek 
providers that would be more knowledgeable and where are they and 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 the providers particularly in the uh, primary care field is they're very busy they have very large practices and um, and so the system is like you can't get for example certain providers and unless you have um, a certain kind of an arrangement with a certain uh, HMO or some, mm -hmm. you know, so those there are all sorts of restrictions that person might not be aware of. Even if you found the right provider, you might not be able to see them. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of issues like that. Kathy, did you want to weigh in on that? Well, I think Hannah and Matthew and Dr. Mania said it perfectly um, that in the adult world, there's probably an idea of what autism is and Autism is different in every single person that has it. And um, it can be verbal, it can be nonverbal, it can be with intellectual disability, it can be without intellectual disability. It's just so unique to each person and that doctors and the healthcare field really needs to understand that everyone is different. But there are some common characteristics such as communication and social issues that can weigh heavily on some of the loved ones with autism and to try to understand a little bit more about them so that when they do have a patient with autism, they can adjust what they're doing to make it easier and to communicate better. So, um, you know, for example, some people with autism, like my son, Billy, can be overwhelmed by a lot of lights, sounds, smells, mm. noises. And sometimes if we explain that to a doctor, we can get a first thing in the morning appointment where you know everything is easier because he doesn't have to wait so long. We can ask him to dim the lights or turn down the music. So, but it's parents who advocate for their loved ones. And now that the, the, these loved ones are all growing up and becoming adults and they're all being thrust into the adult healthcare system, we need to educate the doctors also and mm -hmm. the, the whole healthcare system. We also need yeah. to advocate, I feel, for more of the job providers because yeah. for myself, it was, it was a little bit harder to get myself a job for autism because mm -hmm. people didn't really know that autism really seemed to exist in the autism world because it's it's a bit of a paradox. You think to yourself, should we tell them that they ha that I or have autism to help so they could be more understanding, or should I not and keep quiet? Exactly. I feel like there has to be a bit more of a uh, disability accommodating job providers because mm -hmm. you cannot be fired uh, from a job if you are having some sort of disability. It is against the law. So, and yet, that's exactly right what point, happened man. to me. So one of the things, and we've had this is the um, fourth. Now that's that's fine. But this is the fourth um, uh, conversation we're having around autism. One of them was on employment. The first one was on education. And some of the most interesting, I think, and enlightening conversation we're having, we had in those were the same conversations about disclosure, about mm -hmm. disclosure right. of. Mm -hmm. of disclosing, someone disclosing that they have autism or that a family member has autism, and what does that mean? You know, we know that the research says, which is part of what I think they were instructing you, Matthew, is that mm. if you disclose you have autism, you can be discriminated against, is that that that, that happens, that discrimination happens. Mm. So you're sort of walking a, a fine tightrope there. Um, I'd like to bring us back again to the healthcare field mm -hmm. and what okay. that means for, for people with, with autism. One of the things we, we've gotten to is we've, um, some of these questions that we have lined up here, we're sort of talking about. So one of the questions is, let's talk about the positive thing for healthcare. What, what have you seen as the positive changes for healthcare um, over this time period? Or what are you seeing as, is over the last few years, how has um, healthcare improved for people with autism? A lot more behavioral specialists have started to pop up and there's a mm. lot more people around who actually understand what autism is. Uh, for example, Darcy Manier, who, <laughs> he, he's been excellent in helping uh, uh, me and my mother and my 
the rest of my parent, uh, rest of my family understand that I have autism, and a lot more people uh, are coming together to help children. And they, since now that they understand what's going on, they can figure out how to better uh, integrate or to give several therapies to help them. For example. When I was young, my mother was pushing to get sensual sensory integration therapy in. And now it has been a lot more common with people who have autism because like as like before, it's been it popping up a lot more. So mm-hmm. it's good to see that a lot of people, especially for young uh, children, that they're getting more um, help when they need it. So that way in the future, they will be able to advocate for themselves more clearly and people uh, in their generation that they're going to, whether it's their advocates, their job providers, their health providers or whatever, that they will have a more general understanding of autism and a lot more people will be able to, uh, that have autism can work in the job field and it will be more common and a lot more, a lot more harmony. Well, autism has been one of the drivers of the improvement that we have seen, actually. Um, the increased awareness of autism has driven a lot of the improvements in uh, behavioral services for people um, over, over time. And what we have seen uh, in terms of the um, really uh, significant improvements in the delivery of mental health services and the uh, uplifting uh, of some of the restrictions, for example, in terms of number of visits that a person might have with a mental health provider uh, for outpatient therapy services, or the support for ABA services, for example, for a child or an adolescent with, um, uh, with uh, autism. And uh, many of the other levels of provision, for example, licensed mental health care workers, social workers, uh, clinical psychologists, and uh, approvals for uh, testing for clinical services, for um, psychological services, uh, neuropsychological services, for example, for significant developmental services, the developmental disorders. Uh, These are all improvements uh, that uh, did not exist. On the other hand, those are very, very positive, Uh, but there are certain negatives also. And and I, I wanna just, for example, point out that in adult services, there's no uh, inpatient psychiatric services. Uh, it's very selective, uh, and it's very hard, for example, to hospitalize a person with, mm-hmm. with a, either an intellectual disability or significant impairments in autism. If, for example, there were significant disruptive behaviors, there are only very few units who will take them, and they would wait in the emergency room for a considerable period of time for that to occur. And yes, I think the providers will be very educated, much more so than they were before, because I think we've made significant headway in training providers, particularly in specialties like psychiatry. But there is very limited services in inpatient care. And not that I'm saying that that's a very important provision of medium or provision of care for autism. I don't think it should be. But when it's necessary, it's very difficult to get that kind of service. Uh, The other issue, which I think is a huge challenge for authorization of medications, and this is, uh, and Hannah knows this, and I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and I was shopping with my wife uh, in the South Shore somewhere in a store, and I got a phone call with uh, uh, Hannah's wonderful mom uh, saying that they needed to get this medication authorized. They were at the pharmacy, and the pharmacist had given them the some medications, but it was, they would not give it. And, and we had to talk over, and, 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 and this person was very helpful, this pharmacist, and would look through all sorts of you know, computer programs to try to see if there was, and there was nothing. And, um, and it took us a very long time to finally get it, get it some kind of authorization to get uh, this medication uh, so that she can get a supply. Uh, and that's been going on for a very long time mm-hmm. uh, before then. So we still have authorization issues, and um, medications tend to be expensive, and families can't afford to pay for them out of pocket. 
And so, mm -hmm. and this authorization system, particularly if you have significant difficulties in negotiating the system, is very difficult for you. Uh, parents are now advocating that, but without the advocacy, it would be even more difficult. And people might stop taking the medication altogether or not seek help. Or as, and that becomes the same issue as disclosure or non-disclosure because the issue is really facilitating this type of system. I think, uh, however, overall, we are, uh, it's day and night. I mean, we make huge progress. Uh, and Massachusetts in particular, mm -hmm. and what, uh, you know, what the legislature has done in terms of supporting these services has been terrific. So um, we're in a very good place uh, at the moment, I think, I mean, particularly in mental health. And I think there have been some significant uh, collateral uh, benefit from the advocacy that the autism community has given for the mental health field in general, which I think has been a real plus. So we want to thank the advocacy that was done on behalf of autism which also has benefited many other citizens uh, with developmental issues in Massachusetts. Uh, for example, the recognition of high functioning autism now by the Department of Developmental Services for support mm -hmm. that, doesn't, that didn't exist before. You had to have an intellectual disability in order to be, to be provide services. That's a huge plus. I mean, that's just an amazing achievement, I think. So there have been a lot of sort of a nodal adjustments that have made significant or like policy adjustments that have made significant change in people's lives what i guess you know we're going to start to take questions from um the the folks that are in the audience right now but um you know one of the things that we that i didn't ask and it's not on the questions but i think it's important to ask is you know you all come from different perspectives in this mm -hmm. field um, what advice do you have to um, either people with autism or um, other parents of kids with autism of when they reach that roadblock, when they're, when they're either stuck in the emergency room you know, for a length of time, or they're having trouble accessing health care. What's in, let's try to keep it like the advice as simple as we can. And I know it's not a simple answer, but what advice do you have for someone um, who's having a challenge on trying to access health care? I would say one of the biggest things is don't give up when people tell you no. Yeah, it's your right to advocate that your disability is your right to say that your child has a diagnosis and you want to have it treated. Uh, you have to challenge the, the schools and all the other healthcare providers and stand up for yourself to say, look, I have a disability and I would like to have it treated. It's as simple as that. You, it's also important to be informed about the latest strides and um, therapies because that is also I would say very important to to learn about how you can treat your child or yourself uh, if you have autism. So also it is good to have uh, record good records of your child's diagnosis, I would say. So have uh, details about uh, like you said, autism is a unique thing. It is doesn't it doesn't, uh, it's not this, it's not like a sticker that you can stick on someone. It's not like a, something that could be filed under, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Uh, label. Yeah, yeah, mm. it's not, it's not a definite label that you can yeah. stick on someone. It's, it's a unique thing. So if you had a better diagnosis, for example, of your uh, better, uh, pardon me, documentation on your child's diagnosis, like, for example, uh, like you said, uh, Kathy, that your son has difficulty with sensory uh, inputs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is so. If someone, like for example, if you got 
went to a doctor that knew a lot more about issues with people who have sensory inputs that it would uh, help with that kind of treatment. Absolutely, got it right. What advice do you have to parents of someone with okay. autism? So to, par to parents of someone with autism and to adults with autism seeking um, health care, if you get roadblocks, don't isolate yourself. Reach out. Reach out to other people who have gone before you and have been through the same thing. Let other people guide you. Reach out to trusted professionals like Dr. Munir. Never try to deal with it on your own. There are people who have had similar challenges and who can help you. Reach out to support centers also. Mm -hmm. It's important, very important to have good education. Uh, you can ask anyone besides your, uh, besides your parents, your teachers, uh, mm -hmm. someone that you can trust. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree with you, Kathy. Having good application is uh, excellent for not only to advocate yourself in the job field and in life, but also in healthcare. Yes. Dr. Minier, what do you what advice do you have to people uh, with autism or in that situation families yeah. that are that are having challenges around accessing health care? Well, I think the fact that, for example, I mean, if you face a challenge and the fact that the services might not exist or they might not be adequate, uh, it's not your problem. It's a society problem, and the responsibility has to be shared, and so you have to stand up and defend yourself but sometimes when you're overwhelmed mm -hmm. under a situation when your child is shouting or crying or not sleeping and you're already overwhelmed and you're sleep deprived and if you think everything that exists in the world is your responsibility mm -hmm. and that you have to take care of it and you're burdening people because you're keeping your child in the emergency room and you're and the poor emergency room staff are upset because they have this child there and, and day in and day out. And they want to also have this child go to a, a you know, good placement, but they're frustrated and they want to deal with the problem at the, as soon as possible because medicine is a very categorical field in many ways uh, when it comes to this kind of situation because there's a problem solving field. So we get very frustrated when we can't solve problems. And, um, and I think those are um, challenges that um, make it very hard for parents to adopt that attitude that say, you know, it's, it's not my responsibility. And so that becomes like it's a, becomes a big weight on you. And you say, I'm going to get my child out, sign this child out of the emergency room, take him back home. And the situation is not resolved, and then you need to go back to the emergency room again if the situation, or call the police to help you. And that's very stressful. It goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the answer to that question is what, you know, I know that's the 50th anniversary here, but there's also uh, the anniversary of, you know, the foundation of this whole uh, disability movement. And uh, Eunice Shriver Kennedy is a very good example of that. She wrote a letter uh, at the New York Post, which is a very important letter, during the presidency of Jack Kennedy, where she, um, the, the letter was vetted because she was the sister of a president. And so they showed it to Jack Kennedy, and she was sending this letter to the New York Post. And um, it was about advocacy for developmental disabilities in the United States because of their experience of Rosemary, their sister, mm -hmm. and, and what she thought what should be done to help people with disabilities. And Jack Kennedy made three changes in the letter. And they were all grammatical <laughs> commas and points. No other changes were made. Wow. And, uh, and the letter was published. It's available. You can read it on the internet. Um, and essentially, it talks about you don't take no for anything. You don't take no for an answer. Um, and it's our shared responsibility. We need to, and that's led to the foundations of the Special Olympics movement and many other um, advocacy organizations in the United States essentially built the structure for what followed. I'm not saying that Eunice Shriver Kennedy single handedly created that, but I think she essentially made the arguments, I think there are like six or seven points in this letter of how advocacy should be created and that there should be absolutely 
no acceptance of any lesser point of view in the defense of the individual with developmental issues. However, that's very hard for, for families when they're on their own. And if you're a single mother or if you are frail, I have you know parents who are frail, um, and uh, as they get older, um, and that I always say the siblings should be involved also, or fa other family members. So I, like uh, we have a brother who drives uh, the mom and, and, and his sister to the hospital appointments every time. Uh, and he's amazing. So uh, we have those kinds of uh, supports that help the families to provide additional support for them, to, to provide some more strength for them so that they don't break down. I don't know if somebody said that, this idea that you can, you know, if you put too much stress on any fa family member, that they will break down. And uh, because of, you know, there's a certain sort of a resistance that, that, they cannot, um, that cannot sustain the stress over time. And so you need to really support that, bolster that. Um, because anyone can break down, we know that. So uh, we learned that in the First World War and Second World War. Uh, so we, we, we need to um, bolster that system for people, to those, those families. But I think ultimately they need to be able to defend themselves. And it's not very hard if you, if you face these problems that cannot be resolved. So I'm going to start with the questions and I'm going to actually have Anya read a question from Madeline. Uh, I, get, I think it's well, go ahead, Tanya, read Madeline's question. The one about diagnosis? Yes. Okay. So Madeline, Madeline wrote, I appreciate Hannah mentioning the need to have good records of diagnosis. Dr. Munir, I teach adolescents and young adults on the spectrum who are diagnosed at a very young age, but they have not had full re-evaluations of their diagnosis since the initial one. Do you recommend full re-evaluations for adolescents and young adults? Well, I, I actually recommend that people with the diagnosis of autism should be followed through regularly. Uh, so they should have regular visits. And uh, so it's not just reevaluation, but uh, certainly having a very thorough evaluation that has, um, we learned a lot, for example, in genetics that uh, people, some people just had basic genetic testing, but now we have much more sophisticated testing so if they request a kind of evaluation stations and certainly have that because that's an evolving field. I mean, it's, it makes it's huge advances in that field. Uh, that might be helpful to the other family members as well. And there are certain conditions that that's actually applies, uh, not in all cases, but, but long-term follow-up, it doesn't have to be very frequent if the person is quite doing very well, but I think, uh, and also re reappraisal, uh, of it would be very, very helpful. Um, and records should be available and transparent. I always say this, all our records, my records, and many of the records that we have in developmental medicine and, 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 and also developmental psychiatry in my clinic, they're all available for patients to see and have to print out. And the records are user-friendly. They're, they're designed to be helpful for the advocacy system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it generally tries to make sure that individuals' privacy and what they want to have is protected uh, as well. And it's discussed with, if there are concerns about it, it's discussed because I, it's not released to anybody else, but it's certainly available to the, to the, to the patients and their family, their guardians. Mm -hmm. I have a question from Anita. And it's more of a deeper policy question. And it says many autism specialists no longer accept insurance, which excludes many from care. Is this becoming a widespread spread problem? And how do we discourage that trend? Um, that came up initially because you, it's I believe health, you talked yeah. about Mass yeah. Health, with it, which is the Massachusetts Medicaid. Right payment plan. Right. So, um, you know, the challenge is if, if that's your insurance, right. 
-hmm. and you have limited number of providers, you uh, talked about the same thing in the beginning right. with how difficult it is to work through the system. What do we do to change that? I don't know, but I've come across that that's true in, like, for example, speech therapists, occupational therapists. Um, it's really difficult if you have mass health to get some of the, you know, the top notch ones or ones that are in your area. So I know it is, it's a problem that's going on. It's, it's, it's a hard thing for families. I mean, most general hospitals will accept mass health and you could certainly put pressure on the hospital to develop those services. And I mean, I remember when patients a long time ago when we didn't have the services and they will call up the president's office and say, you know, I am trying to have an appointment for my son and they told me that I have to wait. And, then, and of course, then you'll get a phone call from the president's <laughs> office saying, Dr. Muneer, would you be able to see this patient soon? And so we would. And uh, it's a question of, you know, if you go to Mass General and you look for adult services, I think you, you will, I mean, they will accept Mass, mass yeah. Health. They, and, and most, and we have a lot of general hospitals in Massachusetts. So, um, and we can develop those services. Some of them don't have psychiatric services and some of them do, but I think there has to be, I think for the adult services, this is a very correct question because we really need to develop that. And because people don't have, I think child providers, they might have more parental insurance and more eclectic type of a insurance system. Mm -hmm. But for adults, as they get older and they have their own mass health insurance, that's a problem if they don't accept mass health. I know a common treatment for um, children, and um, it's becoming more common for adults on the spectrum is ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis. And that originally wasn't covered at all by insurance, but since we had so many wonderful people in the legislature um, who have um, passed the Eureka bill, it is now covered by private insurance and also by Mass Health. But the thing is, with Mass Health, you age out of it, there's an end. An end on the um, age. I'm not sure if it's 18 or 21, I believe 21. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's, it, it is difficult to access when mass health or Medicaid is your only insurance. Um, I have a, another question from Cindy and it's um, addressed to the adults. Um, as you've aged and now become into the adult system and they're, um, you know, responsible for your own health care. Um, what's been successful for you in advocating for access to health care and quality health care? Well, again, I'm going to speak in general, but a lot of it is just having a support system that doesn't treat this as kind of a stigma, you know, just kind of expels that. So having people that yeah. you can rely on. Absolutely. And Anna, Hannah, before you had talked about um, advocating for yourself mm -hmm. and the, the, the necessity of doing that, um, do you want to talk more about doing that and managing um, access to healthcare? You mean for advocation? Well, as you um, become more responsible for your health care, what have you found that's been successful for you? What, what um, have you been able to do yourself that you think helped you access health care better? Well, I have uh, been able to, well, it, obviously you've, told, you've heard about Dr. Munir. <laughs> talk about uh, that I had difficulty accessing medicine for for what I need for um, to help with my disabilities. So it, it has been a bit of a struggle, but we, uh, I've, I know how to basically go and get my medicine myself. I mean, I go to see Dr. Media on my own now and before I didn't have to, so. But for healthcare, it's a little bit of a difficult question because uh, I haven't really had that many experiences, I, I would say, because 
is mostly handled by my mother, so it's a little bit difficult for mm. me to stay here. Yeah, but but clearly to have people obviously who you rely uh, on. have people that you rely on, like my my parents, uh, my family, Dr. Manier, my co-workers, my friends. Okay. It's very important to have people to rely on. Thank you. And I think that it would be very, very difficult uh, in our system to have individuals with kind of uh, autism, autism disability to really handle the complexity without some mediation, some support, ultimately, because the system is too complicated, uh, even for an, any individual mm -hmm. uh, with a PhD. Uh, or anything for that matter, double PhD. <laughs> uh, so I think it would be very hard to mediate. And, and I think it, the tragedy would be if you give up, like, you know, Hannah might decide, okay, to heck with it, I'm not going to take this medication. Or something. But she knows that she needs to take the medication, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, kind of needed to function. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So I think it would be very important to uh, for people to understand that and i think that the autism again will be very important in driving the system which has it has done a terrific job and the advocacy movement in the adult services as well but i think we need to also anticipate the problems and solve the problems beside beside so that as you said they are not trailblazers that they have to right. go and you know trying to sort these things out right that sort of reminded me of uh, what of some of the advances we've had over with autism because recently I moved from my pediatrician to a new doctor. She was uh, someone that my mom knows and there wasn't any issues with her knowing that I had autism. She, uh, there was no problems with that. So, yeah. and that's why it's also to have a, like I said earlier, good documentation since now that um, people know uh, that autism exists and that I did have autism. Uh, my new doctor doesn't didn't have any problems uh, when I, that stuff when I asked for a uh, new patient exam. I think that's what it's called. Or is it a new patient uh, physical? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what it is. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, excellent. Um, there's also been a question um, about a screening tool. Um, do you want to, uh, I guess this is for the original diagnosis of autism. Um, I think that I did scroll up into the question. I think that it was more about um, a tool that providers and, here we go, is there a screening tool? It's a question from Bridget. Is there a screening tool or assessment? That would be beneficial for healthcare providers or vocational rehabilitation counselors to use to gain an understanding of an individual's behaviors or environmental preferences or stressors. Very good question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if there's such a screening tool for vocational rehabilitation and assessment of services is available for the adult population per se. Yeah, I uh, think it's more for uh, Mostly it's just a yeah, diagnosis screening mm -hmm. or the identification of autism. However, there are some adaptive behavioral scales that are very general that they can tell you a lot about what that person level up is in terms of the adaptive functioning, um, which really is a very important aspect of the person's functioning. The, that's the ability of a person to take care of certain daily activities and things like that. So there are many tools like that. That's beyond the cognitive function. That's different than the cognitive function. Actually, adaptive function, how this person functions, what they can do for themselves, take care of themselves from day to day, and, and so on. How can, um, so this is a, a very important aspect. So for example, I've used uh, just the criteria for the autism itself, and I created a checklist where I would incorporate it into my notes because they require that age 22, for example, that the person has a diagnosis of autism, when in fact, we know it's been documented fully in the record, medical record, because that didn't matter. So what matters is what officially, what is deemed to be the diagnosis by the Department of Developmental Services to, to 
to provide services because they make their own determination. So the question is actually needs to be addressed in the Department of Developmental Services. How is it that they determine someone has a diagnosis of autism? And I can tell you that there have been instances when a person has unequivocal autism, unequivocal, no questions, and where the person has been denied services for autism because they were told that they need to provide more documentation, like a psychological testing, a neuropsychological testing, even though there was medical records indicating that this person had a diagnosis of autism. So I think part of the problem is that the, the agency system doesn't necessarily trust the diagnosis of autism as well because they say, well, does this person really have autism? Because they will have been entitled to services. So they are entitled to ask that question because then everybody will have the diagnosis of autism and they will receive certain kind of benefit. So, so this issue is a very important issue. How do you then create a very legitimate, valid, sort of a criterion. So I think the DDS do look at many aspects of this and they make the determination. Uh, and, and they are their own, on their own in making the determination. We provide the records that they ask us to provide. We provide the letters that they ask us mm -hmm. to provide. Sometimes we can provide multiple letters. But there have been cases where, as I said, unequivocal cases of autism and they were turned down initially, and I hope that doesn't happen any, again, because it's very stressful for parents mm -hmm. running around trying to get the child to have a documented case of diagnosis of autism, and just uh, just not fair. Yes. And uh, to go through those kinds of loops to prove that your child has a diagnosis of autism, when that has been the case in the medical system for years, mm -hmm. that is not acceptable. But I think that's changing, and I'm very positive about what is happening in the future, but I think there have had, people have had all sorts of horror stories like that, mm -hmm. you know? So one of our audience members is pointing out that, that this discussion has become kind of focused on Massachusetts, but we have people on the call who are from- Oh, okay. Yeah. So it might, oh, so okay. depending on what state they're in, it might yeah. be, the things, the situation might be a little different. So Cindy is pointing out that uh, DDS, here in Massachusetts, DDS eligibility doesn't provide eligibility to all individuals with autism, right? So you could be you could be eligible for services. Yes, gradation. There's right. gradation of services. Right. Uh, they they actually um, uh, I can't. Um, I think that's a question for a DDS person to address. Yeah. But there is a gradation of these, like it based on intellectual disability without intellectual disability. There's all sorts of gradations of uh, that that determinations made. Right. Uh, it's not just a straightforward case like you have diagnosis of autism or not. Sure. So it's a, it's a, yeah, which I think that's fair. I think that's yeah. fair. So I know we're getting near the end of our time. Tom, did you want to, you gave about well, five minutes. Well, sure. I will uh, give a pre-wrap up before <laughs> we, um, before I turn it back to Rebecca to talk about um, what's happening in the future. Um, I want to thank you all today for, um, for this open and frank discussion about autism and healthcare and suggestions um, about how to move forward and, and talking about past experiences. Um, I thank you for, for putting yourselves out there to, to be there with us, to be here with us today. Um, I think it's important. Um, I wanna thank the audience and the folks here from the ICI who are uh, participating uh, and helping us put this together. It's there's a team of us that are working, some of us behind the scenes and some of us in front of the scenes to make this happen. Um, there's also uh, Dr. Munir brought um, a doctor from Turkey with him today to, uh, to observe what's happening, who's sitting here to my left. Um, and um, I wanna thank the audience for, for joining us. Um, this, uh, like again, like I said in the beginning, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the Institute for Community Inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and we are the 50th anniversary. Dr. Munir talked about the movement that took place with Eunice Kennedy Shriver and President Kennedy. That was, it was her energy and movement that pushed the Kennedys, that pushed President Kennedy to create the organizations. The ICI is one of them, the Institute for Community Inclusion. 
is a University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. There is at least one in every state, and it was a result of Eunice Kenny Shriver's work. So um, that's why we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we wanted to do something that was really important and informative, and we chose to uh, talk about autism. So thank you all for participating, and thank the audience for being here with us today and for their questions and for their attention to this really important issue. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to close us out. Thanks, Tom. Um, I echo Tom's uh, sentiments about how uh, grateful I am that you all were here today. Um, everyone, uh, Matt and Billy and uh, Hannah and, um, I'm sorry, uh, Billy's parents. I'm grateful, Dr. Munir as well. Uh, I just put up on the screen ways that you can keep in touch with us to find out what other events are upcoming. We have a Facebook page and a Twitter page. And the last event in this webinar series will be on Thursday, June 28th. Um, it's, uh, it'll be a little bit different. It's called Emerging Topics on Autism. We actually have some staff and faculty at the Institute for Community Inclusion that will be presenting on work that they're doing um, related to autism. And um, I don't remember everyone that's on the panel, but I know several of them at least are on the autism spectrum themselves. So they'll be presenting on work that they're doing in the field, um, some research studies. So that will be another interesting uh, concluding event in the series. Um, just a reminder that this event was uh, recorded today and will be posted on the um, Institute for Community Inclusion webpage. And I'm sure we'll be announcing it on Facebook and Twitter once those um, recordings are posted and live. Um, and again, I would encourage you to continue to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure what the plans are in the future, whether we'll have other events like this, but we've had an excellent response and it's been really uh, fun to work on this project. So stay tuned. Um, thanks everyone for your time today and we'll look forward to next time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.